Hi everybody. So for this one, it should be much shorter than the last one. Uh, we're just going to touch on some of the main points of the recovery of function chapter. And this is all based on the idea of neuroplasticity in the brain. So the idea that the brain can keep changing uh, throughout our lives. And that's something that is new as of the 1990s. Um, before that, we didn't believe that the brain could change. We thought you were born with all the neurons you're born with, and that's all you can do. Um, so this is really cutting edge past 20 years uh, information. So when the brain is injured, we just talked about stroke and ischemias. Um, and so this is what happens. You lose blood supply to a part of the cortex that contains the pH balance um, and it changes the cell membrane within the first few seconds. So right away, can't stop that, can't prevent that. Uh, you have glutamate released throughout the brain. Um, the calcium channels open, so we get toxic levels of calcium. Our mRNA is stimulated and protein production is changed as a result, and tissue becomes inflamed and swollen. Uh, and you can have neural shock that leads to changes in the tissue. Um, this cell threatens cellular integrity far from the injury site, so not just where you had the stroke. Um, changes in cell metabolism can persist for days afterwards. You can treat with anti-inflammatory drugs or neuroprotectants, and those can block calcium channels. And here you see, again, well, how that happens. So within seconds, you have these ionic changes, um, and they can just radiate out and affect everything. And so you can see that with medical intervention, you can have things come back to normal, um, and it's going to take a little bit, um, weeks and months even. Maybe you've had motor cortex damage. Maybe you've had hemiplegia. Um, so what can happen is you can get uh, your reflexes come back, which is great, uh, but you can develop rigidity in your movements. Um, maybe your grasping is facilitated or occurring as part of other movements. Um, so you have to develop your voluntary grasping. Um, so complete recovery can happen in about 40 days, but only occurs in 30% of patients. I think if there's a take one from anything in this chapter that's unfortunately very realistic, it's that most of these injuries are never going to get 100% recovery. They'll get some recovery of function in a lot of cases, but you're never going to be back where you were. Um, so think about on the exams, right, when I ask you about, um, you know, like how likely this, is, this person will make their complete recovery, and sometimes the answer is not. And that's sobering, but true, unfortunately. Um, sorry, I wanted to move for a couple more things on this slide. No, I'm done at all. Uh, so in terms of recovery from aphasia, head injury patients showed um, the most rapid and almost complete recovery, which is great. Um, but the initial deficits are least severe in anomic patients and most severe in people with global aphasia. Makes sense. But the rate of recovery is similar in everybody. As patients are recovering, they progress to other stages, but uh, recovery is often stopped in those with anomic aphasia. It just doesn't progress beyond that. Um, most recovery occurs within the first three months, but some additional over the next 12 months. So this again is why it's really important to get medical care right over um, There's some evidence suggesting younger patients have better recovery. Like the language areas are the most resistant to damage, um, or that are the most resistant to damage. There we go. Where the are uh, functions partially mediated by the brain. So um, here you can see how someone with aphasia might gain some functioning. But again, look at global aphasia. They might get up to like 10% recovery of function in that area, right? You've got some other ones where you're close back up to 100%, which is great. Uh, but look at one of the keys in Brokaw's. You're always going to have some struggle, right, with your language ability. So maybe you've had a traumatic lesion. Um, so they looked at veterans. Um, these would have been Vietnam vets who had brain injuries. And 
you know, it's pretty sobering. We're in the 25 to 50 percent uh, to 40 some percent range, right, of recovering these functions, but half, fully half, showed no recovering of function at all. Uh, so they found that uh, effects of special training, explicit training and practice are really good, so we can be an active part of recovery. And age is really related. So uh, your age of injury makes a difference. And again, really small differences in age and injury. This is, you know, again, vets who were young guys who were drafted, right? And so it's not, we're looking at 17 versus you know, 65, we're looking at 17 versus 26. So that small window, age can still make a difference. Uh, now in terms of surgical lesions, um, sometimes these are purposely done to try to help with something like epilepsy, for example. Um, and sometimes these might be something we didn't expect. Uh, in the lab, we will do these on things like monkeys to see what happens. Uh, you can question the ethics of that for sure. But we've learned quite a bit of information from that. So here you see where often there's little to no recovery on some of these functions. Uh, but then some of them you have improvement, uh, but only if you're young. So again, here you see uh, sort of their abilities and how much they went to recover some of these. And some of it wasn't great. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is Miller is the author in some of these studies, and she's the same Miller that we talked about when we talked about HM. So one of the things we really want to look at is what does this function recovery actually mean for your day-to-day -day life? So uh, we look at employment as a measure of recovery, and we got about 80% recovery. Now, that doesn't mean they went back to their same job, right? You might have had a great white collar job, making a great salary, and now you're employed, but maybe you can only work in a grocery store, right? As a checkout person. It's a noble job, great people who do it, but it doesn't pay the same, right? So you're employed, but you haven't really recovered back to where you need to be. But some people do. Social relationships and leisure activities are often not fully resumed. Um, so people's relationships with others are strained, right? Um, and sometimes they're afraid to go back to their leisure activities or they just physically can't because of other injuries they sustained at the time, right? Um, measures of recovery often overlook which coping mechanisms are people using? Are they using any? Um, this is a really important part that psychologists can help. So we've already talked about how age really affects it. Um, so sex and handedness seem to be uh, linked here. So for sex, uh, we'll see on the next slide how women tend to be a little more lateralized. And I think all of this is learned uh, from the ways we're asked to multitask, for example. Um, and then people who are left-handed are also tend to be uh, more, uh, have more bilateral connections because we're in a world created for white folks, right? If you're higher intelligence and better well-educated, we do have more recovery. Some of that I think is probably just related to socioeconomic status and your ability to pay for uh, the type of recovery that you need. Um, they found that people who are optimistic, extroverted, easygoing, have more recovery, probably because they are more willing to engage with the recovery process. So here's that image showing the lateralization of brains in men and women. Now, how do we help people after brain damage? So there's a variety of things we do, uh, experiential things, behavioral things, psychological things, and again, neuropsychologists can really help with quite a few of these. Um, there are often medicines that we give people as well, particularly immediately post-surgery or as they're recovering. Um, brain stimulation can increase brain activity, so whether that's direct brain stimulation, or whether that is giving people to engage in cognitive tasks. Um, they're starting to look at things like brain tissue transplants and stem cell inductions. Um, and diet can be really important too, making sure that you're getting all the nutrients you need. We don't have a lot of great research on the value of very specific programs, 
Um, the research we do have says that social interaction, environmental stimulation are really important. Movement therapy is important. You have to use any sort of limb that's been affected uh, in order to A, get your physical recovery back, but B, stimulating those plastic changes in the part of the brain linked to that. Cognitive rehabilitation um, is something that we can do as neuropsychologists, but is a struggle. So you have to develop real world tasks that will apply to the life outside the clinic, and that can be difficult. Um, so you have to be creative and innovative, um, and substitution systems can be used in control. Tactile stimulation can be really important. Massage, light stimulation, things along those lines, um, almost ASMR type stuff. Uh, and these are related to uh, actual brain changes, which is kind of cool. Electrical stimulation, so TMS um, is a really promising uh, non-invasive procedure uh, that people use, um, not only for this, but also for things like depression. And then vagus nerve stimulation is safe and approved for epilepsy and depression. Um, and it looks like, based on our animal research, it's something we could use for stroke in the future. And there are other medications we can use that help to help the brain make these plastic changes. Alrighty. Uh, brain, brain tissue transplants and stem cell induction. We've talked about, in particular, stem cells for Parkinson used to be a thing. We've talked about before how fetal stem cells are controversial. Uh, there are some movements, uh, again, that they try to cultivate stem cells from the individual's body uh, and maybe some success with that. Uh, and then again, Diet, really important. Choline, in particular, being really helpful, and vitamins and minerals. All right, so that gives you a nice little overview of some of the recovery of function and sometimes, unfortunately, lack of recovery of function in these individuals.